almost a little over to the left. That's it. You got it. That's it. Push it down just a little bit more. That's caught. Nope, didn't quite go. Push it out some more, honey. That's okay. Almost. Right there. Hold it right there. That's got it. And get the Pascal candle. Push it out some. Good morning. morning. Feels like a full house today. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. I'm thankful for each of you being here. Uh, we are celebrating the third Sunday after Pentecost, uh, proper four in our lectionary. Um, my apologies for the bulletin in haste and not to waste. Uh, your front and back pages are upside down. So just simply flip it up and it should be okay. Uh, I didn't want to reprint them, and uh, it's a little more costly. So I'll be a little more observant the next time. Uh, I invite you to stand as you're able as we turn to our order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for His sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by His authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in hymn number 588. There's a wine. Oh, let me try that again. There's a wine. 
There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There is kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is no place where her sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where her failings have such kindly judgments given. There is welcome for the sinner and the promise grace made good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in his blood. There is grace enough for thousands of new worlds as great as this. There is room for fresh creations in that upper home of bliss. For the love of God is broader than the measures of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is more wonderfully kind. But we make this love too narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify its strictness with a zeal God will not own. Tis not all we owe to Jesus, it is something more than all. Greater good because of evil, larger mercy through the fall. Make our love for God more faithful, let us take you at your word, and our lives will be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. And we turn to our hymn of praise, which we've been using, hymn number 634, and we are using the third verse. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Hail him, you wears of David's line, whom David, Lord, did call. The God incarnate, man divine, uncrown him, Lord of all. The God incarnate, man divine, and crown him Lord of all. And the Lord be with you. And together we pray, Almighty and ever living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick. Make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin and be our power, restore us to wholeness of life. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Raise a song and sound the timbrel, the merry harp, and the lyre. For this is the statute of the Lord, a law of the God of Jacob. I eased your soul from the burden. Your hands were set free from the grave digger's basket. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark in the second and third chapters. Glory to you, O Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God. When Abathar was high priest, he ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And again he entered the synagogue. A man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to him, 
Is it and then and then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus. Praise to you, O Christ. Maggie? There are so many different things we could talk about in uh, the readings for today. Uh, let's start with the first. There, was, there were ten commandments, right, that God gave Moses. And those commandments were about how to live in relationship to you and me, to God, and how we should live with each other so we get along and the world's a better place. Well, one of those related to God was keeping the Sabbath. Now, do you know what Sabbath means? Sabbath? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, that's okay. Sabbath is a particular day in which we set something apart as special. So God wanted people to set apart one day so that God could be honored. We got six days to work, to play, to do all the things we want to do, but let's give one day up for God. So what's that day for us? What's is it today? Sunday for us. Now, in some religions, like the Jewish religion, the Sabbath is from Friday evening at sunset till Saturday evening sunset. So they observe the Sabbath on a different day. Seventh-day Adventists do the same thing. But we remember the Sabbath day as the day Jesus was raised from the dead. And that's how we keep the Sabbath. And what are we to do on that day but just be mindful of God? Now, some people back in the old times when Jesus lived thought that you should do nothing, nothing but go to church, synagogue, and worship God. Now, you could talk to some of these folk of how they grew up with the Sabbath. Because I think in some of their homes on Sabbath, mom or grandma would fix food and cook on Sunday and uh, on Saturday and set it out on the table on Sunday. I know that my wife's family did that up in North Carolina. And they would put the food out for people to eat. But they weren't supposed to work. They weren't supposed to cook. They weren't supposed to do anything but be observant of God and our love for God and God's love for us and relax. Take a day off. So they'd cover the table food with a net so flies wouldn't get on it and people would just kind of come and go and eat. Well, we don't do that anymore. We're lucky that people make a choice to just rest one day. And maybe they might think about coming to church like our good people here to give God some recognition and praise. But Jesus put a little twist on that. He said, if we are to really honor God, if there's some way we can be of help to a person, like the man whose hand was all shriveled up, and the Pharisees busted Jesus because he healed him on the Sabbath, he wasn't supposed to do that work, then we ought to do good. So the Sabbath is to do the things that God would have us to do, to be good people, to care and love for a neighbor that may come our way, to not put that off like the law would say. So Jesus changes that law a little bit for us, that we should be all those things every day. But still, take time. Take time for God. Worship God in a place like this. and. Our lives might be a little better. Okay? Heavenly Father, help us to keep your law in the spirit in which you gave it, to love you by loving one another. Amen. Ah, gee, that worked even better. Thank you. I might be getting a little bit better.
And let us pray. O Lord, may the words of our mouths and meditations upon our hearts be acceptable to you. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I was looking at some of the um, websites that we have for the ELCA, and a lot of the younger pastors are always looking for some guidance and some advice, and sometimes I'll respond to that. And they noted by reading these lessons, and some were older pastors, that these readings had not come up very frequently. I have to look back, and the last time they came up for us was back in uh, 2018. Now, you would think every three years they come around because we're on that lectionary cycle. But besides that, any time readings come up like these and others, there is always a beautiful truth to behold within that. And I'd like to share what I feel is one of those that I gained from reading the text of 2 Corinthians. I believe that a given for every one of us is that we crave or need affirmation. A sense of worth in the eyes of another is more valuable than earthly wealth. And its value is greatest when that affirmation comes from people we admire and we respect. I try my best to look for the good in people. And I'm not very quick to pass judgment, even on bad behavior. And I'm quicker, though I, I think in practice, to offer compliments that might be helpful or might be encouraging. It's a choice one chooses. In seminary, our classes were graded in three ways. We had a class when it came time for examinations and so on. We took the tests that were required, but then we scored our tests by ourself, what we thought and how we thought we did, the professor's word, and the classmates. But key to all of that, whether you'd really messed up and you did a terrible project or work, was always first to look for something that might be good that was accomplished in that coursework on your behalf. It was a choice of an attitude. I'm pretty certain that that stems from me, that sense of needing affirmation from somewhere back in my life. Maybe I didn't receive a whole lot of it. And sometimes I catch myself seeking and looking for that from others by leading questions. Well, how did I do today? What did you think of that? And now that opens it up to a big can of worms, doesn't it, James? Because it might not be what you want to hear. Of course, it could lead to those things. And as you can tell, I still have faith that humanity is not on a road to destruction, that we can pull this thing off that God has given us to do. I won't give up on the good that is in people. And we know that another side of people just wants to be recognized, to have their moment in the spotlight from time to time. You put in the work, let's affirm what that work is as good. And that even applies to backward and introverted folk. Young preteens, oh, maybe you've met those along the way or you've come through that time in their lives. They have a tendency for a lot of drama, good drama and bad drama. They will seek attention by acting out, transforming from that little prince or princess that was so wonderful to their outburst of defiance or malice. Simply, in one moment, I love you, Daddy, can quickly turn into, well, you can guess, I hate you and this family. That's where it's at. It disturbs me to see so many, and, I, and this is categorization, but I think statistics bear it out, to see so many angry, young, white boys who have committed acts of violence in schools. It's an unusual statistic. And it shows up as well among abusers and serial crimes as well. Perhaps it's a cry for attention or it's fighting against abuse that they suffered when they were younger. It's a cry for, look, see me, I'm here, I am somebody. 
And sometimes people will just crave any kind of attention, good, bad, or indifferent. How simple it would be to turn much of that around in our broken world by adopting a more positive attitude, a kinder and a gentler treatment of each other, rather than always looking for what might be wrong or what is adversarial in a relationship. I'm blessed to be able to look back on the 76 years that I've lived and to find so many positive highlights in my life. I have a strong work ethic. I got that from my parents. I was working to make any kind of pocket change because it wasn't very um, amount, it wasn't there when I was young at age 10 and I've not stopped since. I have been married for 52 years, loved by my wife, loved by my children, even when I'm not very lovable. We raised three children, and each successful on their own. None of us have ever been arrested. None of us has spent any time behind bars except me, one night by choice when I was in seminary, to just have that experience. Not a good choice, my friends. I have been loved by so many people, and I've tried to love them in return. I don't harbor grudges or hatred. I'm responsible and generally take ownership of the mistakes and errors in my life and try and do better. But at the top of all of that, I know that I, with you, I'm a child of God. A child of God, a man created in God's very own image, and that has helped shape who I am today by knowing whose I am today. Knowing that we are children of God, created in God's image, should count for something when we're dealing with each other. We may look different. We may talk different. We may be of different ethnic and cultural traditions, some from privilege and some from disadvantage, but God sees us all as His own. Think about that when you start to pass judgment or you start to look down your nose at somebody else because they're just not like you. Most of us are hard enough on ourselves much less needing to be hard on others. It matters to me that God sees me and sees you in the living of each day, sees our sins and our errors, sees how we make application of what we have been blessed with, sees us in our imperfections and our little perfections from time to time. You know, imperfections tend to stand out more, do they not? But then, no, that enables us to strive to do a little bit better when we can identify what those things are. To grow because of the grace and mercy of God. But the grace and mercy we give to each other is not always the same. It's not always present. To Him, be God, be the glory forevermore. Jesus, our Lord, who meets us as we are. Best selfie that we could ever post, if you're into posting selfies, is to be that of the image of Jesus in which we might emulate. Let me see a picture of a young person working in a food bank or serving in a community event or cheering on someone else with some encouragement Or like the little kindergarten boy we heard about a number of years ago who was the first to arrive at school when the doors were open and for every one of his classmates, he greeted them with a hello, a handshake, or a hug. They had a choice as to what they wanted. And he did that while he was there. I'm proud of my grandson, Adam. I don't know if the school systems down here have what's called unified sports. But in Maryland, they have what's called unified sports. It's a combination of able-bodied and able-minded students to be paired with disadvantaged, handicapped 
people as well in sports so that they can support them and encourage them. Adam could have done very well in track, track and field. He's a good runner. But he chose instead to do unified track and field, where he was paired up in a relay, one able-bodied person with a disadvantaged or disabled person. And in working together, coordinating and supporting each other, encouraging each other, they won the state championship this year of all of Maryland. And he is so excited to return for his senior year, thinking of the other before the self. How about trying to model your life and your living each day by that Old Testament adage, we are blessed to be a blessing. And I can't think of much of a better epitaph to put on one's tombstone, if you choose to have a tombstone. We're going to be cremated and who knows where we'll end up. But uh, if you had a tombstone to say something like this, he or she was blessed to be a blessing, and they were. I guess what I'm getting at is that so much of our lives are spent seeking affirmation, wanting to have a sense that we are of worth and value and importance that we forget. We're already precious in God's sight, in the eyes of the Creator forevermore. Paul writing to the Corinthians in his second epistle, We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. In all that we are, all that we say, all that we do, we should be living in such a way that God's goodness and God's glory are visioned through the life we are living. And here again, to be the very reflection of the heart of Jesus, to be subject to Christ and his new covenant that Christ has revealed to us is to change where we place the emphasis in our lives. Me, mine, looking good for the sake of the self, lifting up our own ego over another's, being braggadocious. It's the wrong syllable for Christian life. Our life is to be one that brings glory and honor to God. And we do so by the life we choose to live. And he's given us the example in Jesus as to how we should live. St. Paul went on to write, and I love this verse, but we have this treasure in clay jars, that's our bodies, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We know the body is fragile. It contains what is precious, and we should cherish both to preserve the body in the best way we can so that we might serve God with the gifts and the extraordinary powers He has imparted to us. It is God's gift of various talents and blessings that are held in these fragile vessels. We are but clay jars easily broken, and we are not meant to be here forever. We know that. And along that brief, or for some of you, longer journey of life, that God gives us. We are privileged to be endowed with many and varied gifts. Yes, we have the free will to use those gifts, but they were meant to be given away for the sake of making this world a better place. In the gospel reading for today, we see what Jesus did with the Sabbath. We see a conflict arising among the leadership of the day, the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees, and rabbis, with Jesus' people and his disciples. When God gave the people of Israel the law, it was intended to guide and to direct their lives for good, for the sake of good. They were a rebellious people when they received them, in need of rules to live by, so that they could become a godlier people. Their righteousness 
and their worth would be defined by keeping the law. So they got pretty anal about that and were very particular about the laws of their time. But we know in our hearts that the right thing to do is to give God our daily attention every day, and particularly one day maybe. But the law required them to set apart a day of the entire week to honor God. And so the law keepers of Israel are a bit upset with Jesus when they see him walking with his disciples to the grain fields. No problem walking on the Sabbath. It's interesting, uh, I don't know if you've been to a big city or lived in a big city where there's a large Jewish community, but around the Beltway of Baltimore years ago, they would define by a rope or a cord that you could see off of the Beltway of how far you could travel from home to synagogue regulated that much. I don't know if that was consistent around the world, but indeed in that community, the law imposed regulations upon people to give them good order. But Jesus said that was a little different way of looking at it. The Pharisees accused them of not just walking through the grain fields, but he saw them rubbing their hands together to get the husk off and have something to eat. Now, maybe they needed the nourishment to get to synagogue. It's nothing wrong with eating, but they were looking for ways to trap Jesus. Jesus noted to them, David entered the granaries where the priests were only to eat from, and he gave the grain away in his own day. Your own good king, David. And then this statement, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Jesus' theology, God is chiefly known as love, and the law and purity rituals are for humanity's own good. Or even better, they offer ways that humanity can respond to God's grace and gratitude by acts of goodness. In that same text, Jesus pushes the Pharisees a little bit more. There's a man that is crippled. He has a withered hand. And Jesus has the audacity to heal in the synagogue on the Sabbath a work that was prohibited. To do what? To show the power and the goodness of what God could do not in defiance, but we, we are called to do. You see, the new covenant that we live under, emphasis is defined by Jesus' actions. It is not about you, it's not about me or us, but it's all about the other and about God. It just so happened that it was the Sabbath, and there was someone and other that needed a sense of affirmation and help. You know what happened for that man? When you were crippled, when you were uh, disfigured in any way, when you had a flow of blood if you were a woman, you were relegated to not be at Sabbath, to worship the Lord God. He gives this man's life back to him, as he did to the blind man, the crippled, the lame. He restored their life, that there could be a wholeness and they could be a part of the community that they had been restricted from. Jesus comes to extend the world and to reveal the love, the mercy of God, which was free to all of God's created. The Pharisees might have been better off rejoicing that the man had been healed and restored. But they chose not, and they looked for ways to entrap him. That's sad. Jesus leads hungry disciples to the fields so that they might eat and proceeds to the synagogue where they might give full attention to the worship of God. Which was the better way? The Pharisee is who would condemn, or Jesus who would enable a right response? I'd like to say this 
in conclusion. And it's probably time to do that. Jesus' way is that of grace and mercy with a focus on others and not the self. A friend of mine once said to me, it's far better to have others blow their horn for you in praise than you to blow your own horn. The Pharisees were big about blowing their own horn, of lifting themselves as, look how good I am. But don't you feel a little different when someone else affirms you? And maybe that's what our good work can be. I know many of you do that. Maybe all of you make a concerted effort to do that. And flying in the face of those are the things that we find hard to see any good in, to find any good that might be lifted up. If the church of Christ Jesus in this world is about self-aggrandizement, focused on itself and its own survival, it is truly missing its boat. If, however, it is the servant church, reaching out in love to those it serves, to the neighbor in need, it will be a truer reflection of the Christ who has shown us his more perfect way, one who gave it life in the first place, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to turn to uh, hymn number 820, and uh, as you're able, I invite you to stand. 820. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> oh, Savior, precious Savior, whom yet unseen we love. O name of might and favor, all other names above. We worship thee, we bless thee, to thee alone we sing. We praise Thee and confess Thee, our Holy Lord and King. O bringer of salvation, O wondrously hast wrought Myself the revelation, of love beyond our thought. We worship Thee, we bless Thee, to Thee alone we sing. We praise Thee and confess Thee, our gracious Lord and King. In the awfulness dwelleth all grace and power divine, the glory that excelleth, O Son of God, is thine. We worship thee, we bless thee, to Thee alone we sing. We praise Thee and confess Thee, our glorious Lord and King. O oh, grant the consummation of this our song above. In endless adoration and everlasting love, then shall we praise and bless thee, 
where perfect praises ring, and evermore confess me, our Savior and our King. We share the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. We come before you, our triune God, to pray for our community, ourselves, and our world. Lord, guide your church to expressions of faith that bring rest and release. Teach your faithful people to be attentive to the spiritual, physical, and societal weariness of our neighbors, that we proclaim your grace through tangible acts of mercy and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us mindful of the rhythms of nature as the days lengthen and the seasons shift toward summer. Grant relief to areas facing flooding or drought, tornado, and storm. Bring favorable weather for the flourishing of crops, of gardens, and orchards. Bless those who are attentive to this world and its needs that we might be sustained by the bread which you offer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. When there is affliction in our world, bring healing. Where world leaders are perplexed, bring clarity. Give a spirit of discernment to political advisors, institutional researchers, economic analysts, and all vocations that inform the work of government and policy making. We pray that negotiations for a ceasefire and resolve to the war in Gaza might be successful, and that people continue to look for peaceful resolve to the war in Ukraine. Bring your help, hope, and peace to bear in these troubled lands. Lord, in your mercy. Provide wholeness and respite to all who are weary, those who struggle in any way, those who care for them. And we pray especially your healing help to bear forth in the lives of, of Donna and Miriam, of James and Evelyn, Evelyn Tompkins, Elaine, Mark, and Katie, for Laura, for Roger and Hunter, for Jenny and Charlotte, Gail, for Kenneth and Gay, for Barry, for Linda, for all whom we intercede for this day. Strengthen first responders, health care workers in their time of exhaustion or frustration. Guide the hands of surgeons and physicians and all who would care for the other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stir our hearts toward abundant generosity among neighbors who experience hunger or food insecurity. Bless feeding ministries, food bank efforts, especially community gardens and farmer markets and food pantries. Open their hearts, our hearts, and the tables to provide well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we remember the communion of saints whose lives made visible the saving life of Jesus Christ. Guide us by their example 
to embody the treasure of your love for the sake of our world until we come to our final rest in you. We give thanks especially for the life of Nancy Scholl and for others precious and dear to our memories. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, to your Son, Jesus, and all God's people say amen. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you all. Please greet one another accordingly. Our liturgy and our service continues as we turn in your bulletins to the words designated for our offering. The offering of ourselves, our gifts, and the offering of our blessed Son, Jesus, who gives his whole in himself. And let us pray together our offertory prayer. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. My friends, our Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he took some bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. It's given for all people for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup. The second time during that meal, a cup of blessing. And he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you. It's shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. All is prepared, come, share in his presence. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Sarah, the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ it shed for you.
Yeah, come all the way down. We've got a full table today. Amen. Evelyn, this is the body of Christ given for you. Amen. James, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. Maggie, the body of Christ given for you. Mary Ann, the body of Christ Amen. given for you. Lane, the body of Christ given for you. Donna, the body of Christ, it's given for you. Jan, the body of Christ given for you. Judy, this is the body of Christ given for you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, the body of Christ given for you. Roger, the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ, Inez, given for you. Freddie, the body of Christ given for you. Nessa, the body of Christ given for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace, His mercy, and His peace now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. If you find your way to your bulletin, there you'll find printed our post-communion prayer. Together we pray, God of abundance, with this bread of life and this cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine on you, to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor, giving you His peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Life gives us so many opportunities to be the Christ in our world. And uh, we are thankful that Roger has completed a marvelous duty and responsibility and love for his wife, Nancy, to see her through in her home as best as he was able and to bring her as the Lord would do so to the kingdom of God, which is hers forevermore, and to return him to our flock. We're thankful for that, Roger, and we enfold you in our love and our prayer in these days of uh, preparing and looking for what the next step of life will be. We thank you for caring for our beloved Nancy. Yep, And she for you, too. It was a mutual thing. Yeah, that's how life should be. Welcome back. Welcome back. Any uh, birthdays, anniversaries, or celebrations that we should be mindful of? Nothing in the community this day. That's all good, okay? I'll, we had some wonderful food. Thanks for everybody that provided that last week for those that were able to be here. Uh, we ate richly and uh, were well, well fed. Uh, and a few folk from the community dropped in and got a meal too. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Anything else, Judy? Yes, ma'am. Oh, he did. So they finally made it official, huh? Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, good. Very good. 
Well, they've got a couple of things on their plates, like maybe a baptism for a child, maybe a marriage <laughs> for them as a couple. Uh, we do things differently these days, but it's okay. They're doing the right thing, right? And we lift that up and we're thankful for, for that commitment that they've chosen together. His fiance's name again. Uh oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Very good. Well, we'll keep them in our thoughts and prayers for a good life. Excellent. Good. Judy's birthday. Oh, yeah, Julia. Okay, good. And how old will she be? Excellent. That's a, that's a good start. Wow, 39. Wonderful. Julia. Okay. You'll be 39 too. Okay. Wow. All kinds of... Okay. Good day. A good week. A good month. Good month. Great. And yours is the 21st. Okay. It's a coming. I won't ask how old you are because you don't look your age, whatever it may be. 65 indeed you are. I know. Forever, right? And I will not dispute that. Oh, no. No way. Oh, my gosh. We should all be so lucky. As viable as you are, girl. <laughs> okay. We... <laughs> oh my goodness. You're special, Mary Ann. <laughs> We're thankful for that. Uh, let's stand for our closing. Oh, uh, Tian, one more. Okay. I'll, we'll turn the camera off and we'll convene. Okay, let's close with our hymn number 543. Go, my children, with my blessing, never alone. Waking, sleeping, I am with you. You are my own. In my love's baptismal river, I have made you mine forever. Go, my children, with my blessing. You are my own. Go, my children, sins forgiven, at peace and pure. Here you learn how much I love you, what I can cure. Here you heard my dear son's story. Here you touched him, saw his glory. Go, my children, sins forgiven at peace and pure. Go, my children, fed and nourished, closer to me. Grow in love and love by serving, joyful and free. Hear my spirit's power filled you. Hear my tender comfort stilled you.
Go, my children, fed and nourish, joy, whole and free. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And have a seat. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie.